All right. So this is about the candidates, and we will have them do most of the talking. I'll be asking some questions submitted by readers. There will be no audience questions tonight, I'm sorry to say, but we have many excellent questions. Just a, a quick overview of the House rules. Uh, each candidate will get two minutes to give an opening uh, statement. Uh, there'll be a little chime going off uh, with our timekeeper if time runs out. Uh, after they give their opening statements, we will then go down the line and then we will go through questions. And uh, there will be a random order. So we'll start uh, with one candidate down the line and then we go to another issue and we'll start with another candidate in the interest of fairness. So uh, why don't we uh, start uh, to my far left and we'll have a two minute opening statement from this candidate. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. My name is Jimmy Mata, and I'm running for Beery City Council, position number three. Today I'm very happy and excited to see many friends and new friends and supporters that are out in the audience, and some of those that are here tonight to listen uh, to the, some of the, the things that I want to help uh, Beery. Well, let me, let me start off by saying youth and their future. Very important. We don't lead, if we don't build our leaders for the future, our country's in trouble and our community's in trouble. The other one is economic development, good paying jobs, training, a place that uh, uh, people right now are struggling, rents are out of control, taxes are out of control. The other one is public safety. Just last night, my neighbor had two of her vehicles vandalized and a window broken. You know, the, they're, they're just working class people. Every day they get up, just make enough to pay the bills, and today they're having to struggle to figure out how they're going to go buy tires for their vehicle. That, I'm very excited to hear your questions. I'm uh, excited to uh, move forward to the November 7th. Thank you. Hi, I'm Debbie Wagner, and I'm an incumbent. I've been on the council for four years, and it's been my honor and privilege to serve the people of Burien. I have been a volunteer in my children's schools in the Highline District for 30 years, art docent, room parent, worked in sports with the PTA, PTSA, um, helped a lot of uh, youth programs start and become more robust in Marion since I've been a council member. We also have restarted the police youth explorers as well as an after school youth basketball program. Um, I've been a volunteer musician in a community symphony off and on for 10 years. I currently volunteer with Transform Burien, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to help the homeless and vulnerable population. Um, I was twice elected president of the Citizens Against SeaTac expansion and um, <laughs> co-founded a national environmental organization and worked with the Regional Commission on Airport Affairs, a government-funded group to help uh, fight, that, fight the Port of Seattle and the FAA on flight paths and environmental damage in our community. That's why stopping a new flight path through the heart of Burien is so amazing and I'm honored and very thankful I could be a board member treasurer and a part of that victory with the Quiet Skies Coalition with a great group of people who were instrumental in putting together a winning case. Um, my primary career in education is in accounting and bookkeeping. This background has helped me understand Burien's budget. Um, and also in customer service, this background has helped me understand why it's important to have friendly, transparent, and responsive government. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pedro Olguin, and I'm running for position one. Uh, here in Burien. First of all, thank you very much. So honored, so pleased, and really so nervous to be in front of all of you. Um, <laughs> thank you for the VTOM blog and the host and our great moderator, and also to Joe for, for being here. Um, I'm running in Burien because I believe in having an inclusive community, a community that believes in itself, that believes in, in diversity. Pardon? that believes in uh, diversity, that believes in each other, that believes in love, and that believes that together, despite our differences, we can work together to find common ground to resolve the everyday problems that are affecting our communities every single day. And whether you agree with my viewpoints or not, me being out, out here and me being present 
is really to, to talk about our issues and for me to learn from you what a, a real solution should be for the area. Um, that's why I'm running. So whether we agree or not, I'm willing to listen. I think that's a key cornerstone to leadership that we need nowadays in Burey. So thank you to all of you. to represent you in position one also on the Burien City Council. So I've called Burien home for over 16 years. My wife and I bought our first house in North Burien. Back then we enthusiastically voted to incorporate and become part of Burien. Uh, all my children were born here in Highline Hospital. They all go to the Highline School District and they've celebrated all 28 years of their collective birthdays at La Costa. Burien is my home. I'm deeply invested in this community and its future matters to me. The safety of our residents should be our council's top priority. Crime in our community has skyrocketed and we need law enforcement with correctly prioritized direction from our city government. Our community should not be a place for thriving or should be a place for thriving businesses and safe neighborhoods. Not a testing ground for policies that enable the lifestyle of addiction. We cannot afford to repeat the failures of Seattle and King County. We need real and proven solutions. I will not support low barrier shelters and I will not support safe injection sites in Burien. Our second priority must be our economic development. A vibrant, healthy business community enhances Burien for everyone. Sales tax is one of the largest sources of revenue for the city. The more successful businesses we have, the greater our ability to meet our obligations and provide the services our residents require. It's a win-win. Burien, this is not complicated. Keep our streets safe, evaluate and target the current causes of crime and enable law enforcement. Foster a competitive business environment to attract, build and grow businesses in our community. This is what our city government should be doing. Please help me put the city of Burien back on the right track focused on Burien first and guided by common sense. All right, so some audience reminders. That's the last time you should applaud so that we can respect our candidates' time. So please do not uh, make any remarks while they're speaking so that they get the floor. And if you are disruptive, uh, we have security here. I don't think that will happen, but I'm just reminded that this is about the candidates, so let's let the candidates have their say. And the first question uh, will go right down the line. We're going to start with some philosophical questions before we get to some issue questions. The first question from a reader that came into the blog was a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who said, a genuine leader is not a searcher for consensus, but a molder of consensus. Please tell us whether you agree or disagree with that and why. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Yes, I agree. You know, I uh, moved to Burien, Washington in 1998 and I became a leader of a union. And the unions for a long time were struggling with the growth of minorities uh, coming to the ranks. And it was difficult. Difficult choices had to be made. Difficult speeches had to be made. Uh, and having the real conversation that America was changing and our community is changing. And I do believe that Dr. Martin Luther King hit the, uh, hit the nail on the head. It's about inclusion. It's about making a hard decision. It's about being visible when some, somebody's being wrong. Yeah, I Could you repeat the question for me, please? Sure. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, a genuine leader is not a searcher for consensus, but a molder of consensus. Do you agree? Well, that's, to me that's a, a statement that would, would mean that I would go out and search for what uh, people want, which is what I think is the role of a council member as a servant of the community. So I think we are listening to the people and responding to what the people want, what their desire is for, what they think is best and helpful for our community. 
Um, we do have polls that say that the number one priority of citizens <coughs> of Marion is public safety. So we responded as a council to that need this past budget cycle by adding two new police officers. And we were able to budget that with the money that we had rather than raising taxes to do it. We did rely on some amount of a federal law enforcement grant that um, we are using to help supplement some of the costs that, that is needed for these. Um, we did have the option of adding three officers, but with the cost of each officer at a quarter of a million, it's pretty difficult to do that in the budget constraint environment that we have. So we did the most that we could with what we had and stretched our dollars as far as they could go and we're able to add an additional element of public safety in response to what the community had asked. How do you disagree with Dr. Keene? Um, so that said, I, I believe that we can only control our responses. This condition, situation, change, uh, God knows that in the work that we do on a daily basis, we have to reach consensus to with employers, with members, with advocating for working families every single day. And it's not an easy text. It's very complex to bring people together. And yet, when we start talking about our values, what's important to all of us, when we start talking about the daily struggles that we've got to make ends meet and how disproportionately folks are affected, especially when they're retired or they're a low income, and we start talking about how do we get to common ground to find solutions, then we start talking about our values, what matters most, and that's when we can move forward. And I think once we get to the crust of our values, and that's something that we haven't done for a long time, uh, we can't find common ground. And that's the most important part. So we have to build that common ground collectively. Uh, yes, it is hard to disagree with Dr. King. I think if you're talking about a moral argument and a cause for justice based in a moral argument, absolutely, uh, you mold conviction. Uh, that's what you do when you have conviction based on a moral issue. Uh, I think Debbie is also right because there are different times for different types of leadership. In this role, uh, it may be times where we mold uh, that or there are times where we may seek it. All right, uh, next question. We'll start with you and then go like that. This is from another reader. Uh, who says, uh, I would like to hear the candidates speak about how they plan to work with people, both fellow city council members, as well as constituents who do not support their personal views. Well, again, um, our personal views are not really what's important in governing the city. What's important is that we are responsive to the needs of the city. And as a policymaker, we do need to collaborate together as a council. We do need a majority vote. And that is uh, something that a lot of the issues we discuss cross barriers on philosophy. But uh, if you're willing to work together, there's nothing that you can't accomplish. But we have a council that frequently gets us down into the details of things of minutia detail that doesn't really have anything to do with making policy. It takes up a lot of our time. So um, one of the things that we were able to do recently is we went through our entire council policies in one meeting. And this is something that took months and months and months of struggle and trial and error in the past years. But we were, you know, absent a couple of council members and it was easy to come to consensus and move forward. So. <laughs> we, were, we were able to get things done. And I think people that want to work together, that is a real blessing to have on the council, regardless of what your views are. I would look forward to having that opportunity, continuing some of the collaboration we had. This way. Still nervous. Um, <laughs> so yeah, at the end of the day, it's, it's about listening to each other. 
right? It's not about it's not about having the right solution. It's not about coming up with these are my ideas, but really, are we humble enough to listen to each other? And we don't have to agree on everything. In fact, people don't even need to like me. I know Lisa loves me, and I love her too. Uh, <laughs> and the, so the reality is, we don't have to like each other, but at the end of the day, can we listen enough to each other to get to common ground? And I think that's going to be a common theme thing moving forward, and I hope it's something that the rest of the candidates running for office really start taking into consideration. One of the things that we've had over the past years in our city council is that it's been dysfunctional, it's been dysfunctional because people are not willing to listen to each other. And so this is our opportunity to change that dynamic and move together and work together collaboratively. Uh, yeah, absolutely, it has to be collaborative. I I think that's been one of the key problems we've had for the past four years is we've had uh, people focusing solely on their own agendas, uh, blind to what anyone else might want. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in the field of project management working with large diverse groups of people, large uh, different divisions within a corporate environment, all having different needs. Uh, you have to learn to work with people, listen to people. Uh, I'm pretty sure I could work with anyone up here or anyone in this room on pretty much anything. Well, the first order of how do you handle a group to build conscience, uh, conscience and, con and uh, a connection? Well, first of all, you know, it's emotions, right? Uh, if you feel scared, uh, if you feel like you can't speak, if you feel you haven't been heard, you feel like nobody's listening to you, how do you build consensus? You know, you start building consensus by finding common ground. We definitely know that Burien has a huge problem with our youth hooked on drugs. We definitely know that we have property crimes. We definitely know we have homeless that have no shelters, homeless that are struggling with mental illness, soldiers that are coming back with post-traumatic stress. We, if we can come down and figure out that we definitely have those issues, what are our common ground on the thought process of how to fix it? I think the problem is that we focus on fighting what we don't agree with instead of focusing on what we do agree with. And so that's uh, what you would have uh, with me as a your city council is having an open door policy, learning to respect one another's opinions. This is an easy one. Uh, a reader would like to know where you live, how long you've lived there, and uh, why are you running? So I live at 645 Southwest 153rd Street. <laughs> <laughs> Ask Chuck, he's been there many times. <laughs> that said, um, I've been in Burien twice. When I just arrived here in Burien, uh, to Washington, I moved into Burien, um, and then moved out, and then came back, moved to Auburn, moved back, and I've been here since last two days of August, first week of September. I've been in, in, uh, in Burien, and I love Burien. It really is a community where I think my children can grow up, um, where we can build a future together. And I think like many families that are moving into our community, they're being displaced by higher rents and, uh, and it's unaffordable to stay in Seattle and other communities. And so I think f folks are being forced to move into South King County. And if we look at the demographics, there's gonna be a lot of new arrivals that have been here less than five years. Um, and that's really, I think, I, whether you've been here 30 years, 20 years, uh, two months, uh, your voice deserves to be heard. And I wish that everyone, irrespective of, the, of their longevity, can continue to participate and grow our political process here in Burien. Uh, and that's the reason why I'm running, because I want to make sure that every voice is counted, that there isn't a litmus test on residency to your participation. I live in Gregory Heights. I've lived in the place I live now since 2011. Uh, I lived in North Burien. I moved to North Burien. Uh, and then I moved to where I live now. Uh, I'm running because I'd like to make this town a safer place and contribute to that as much as I can for my children and everyone else's children. I live over by Chelsea Park. I live over at this apartment complex that has no after school programs for children. That's where I live at, a community that needs a lot of help. I've been in this community for over 20 years. My son graduated from Aviation High School. 
My daughter was just accepted to Aviation High School. My daughter was born at the Burien Hospital, Highline Hospital. My sister graduated from the Highline High School. So I, I'm invested in this community. Why am I running? Well, I'm running because I believe that, number one, I'm bilingual, bicultural. That should be a strength to go out and talk to a community that has not been talked to in a long time or talked with. We have so many Spanish-speaking businesses in Burien that have no voice. Now, if you look at me and say, well, is Jimmy just going to concentrate on the Spanish-speaking individuals? No. What about everybody? Look, to have a beautiful community, you got to work together from different cultural backgrounds. It's not only Latinos and Anglos that live in this community. We have Asians that live in our community. You know, we have Africans that live in our community. And why I'm running is because I believe we need to bring a balance into our community where we really have, we have a, the ability to listen to all sides. It doesn't matter what political alliance you have and to be treated with respect, dignity, and have an open door policy. I've uh, lived in Burien for 20 years. Um, I've been a, a resident of the South End almost my entire life. I did immigrate, and my mother was an immigrant, and I'm uh, also bilingual, but I have a second language that's not useful. <laughs> so, <laughs> pardon de moi. Um, and uh, my kids have all gone through Highline schools and have graduated, and. Many are successful adults. I'm very proud of that fact that um, of having worked in the schools and having volunteered there and been a big part of my children's success. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to see more youth programs in Burien because I, having kids in Burien, I knew that they did not have a lot of choices of things to do and wholesome things that kids can do, being involved in sports. All, all of our children were involved in sports programs, but some of them are not accessible to some kids and some are not cheap or free. So that's why I wanted to get the after-school basketball program started, and now a lot of youth are participating. So instead of just 11 people that make a basketball team and 800 kids that try out, there's now hundreds that can be involved in after-school sports. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to go into some issues, and I'm going to let the candidates know, and you guys know, that they each have this little pink card, which they're allowed to use once during the forum as a kind of a trump card to respond to another candidate for up to one minute. But they still have two minutes uh, for each uh, issue. We'll start now with, with you. And we have a reader who asked about SeaTac Airport. And the reader's comment, Pull it up, was, with our proximity to SeaTac Airport, what do you see as some of the major challenges and solutions over the coming years of growth, for instance, with respect to issues such as noise or air pollution? Uh, I see that as something we're gonna have to fight for a while. Um, the airport's always gonna be our neighbor. Uh, we're gonna have to hold them accountable to follow the proper processes do the proper environmental studies before they change things. Um, I don't think they've always done the best job of that, and we're going to have to hold their feet to the fire. Uh, long term, honestly, I'm not an airport expert, um, but we're going to have to constantly stay on them. Well, if you live in Burien, you know how it is to wake up at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning uh, woken up by a plane. Um, I commend uh, the people that have been working on, on the issues that are confronting Burien with the airport, with quiet skies. Environmental impacts, very concerning to me. You know, I have a daughter that I'm concerned with, a son and a family member that, uh, that I'm very concerned about more than anything is our community. And the lack of the airport taking the responsibility that, I don't care if your position is, this is America speak English, my position is if it's something to do with your safety and your health, you should provide information in other languages. Very important. On top of that, the poor commissioners, they will continue to be, we're going to make them accountable. Not only for our health, but also for our, our, our economic development. You know, there's major jobs that are coming up at the airport, and we should have our youth that are at risk, that aren't going to go to college, 
going and working on those jobs and working with the unions to, to open the doors for some of our people in our community. On top of that, if you own a business, there should be automatic opportunities to work at the airport for procurement for our community. Small businesses, we're struggling in this community. We should be able to have some of those individuals that come through here at SeaTac or the other communities that have uh, places where people can stay, but at least to come and eat at in our community. We need well-paying jobs with apprenticeship opportunities, and I'll make the, uh, the airport accountable for that. So this is an issue that I've been working on for a long time, and I'm very concerned about the environmental impacts of noise and emissions. Uh, there's a big issue with cumulative noise and emissions, and I'm concerned about the effects on body systems and the environment. So. Um, I studied the environment, the little known impacts of the air pollution from jets is very terrifying. Uh, I learned a lot about it and in fact I wanted, I wanted to write a book about it because it was so much information that was so obscure and little known <coughs> by so many people. I wanted to make sure that as many people could find out about it as wanted to know. Uh, it took a lot of research and a lot of work to find this out. They don't publish this very regularly. There's only a handful of studies on airport emissions, but they are detrimental to health, and we do have a huge problem in our airshed. And the noise on top of it weakens us. It also wakes us up. It, it damages our bodies. Uh, it also damages the environment. So um, I'm concerned about this. I'm working on it. I'm involved with a group that's getting an air quality study going on, uh, looking at the ultrafine particulates. I'm keeping up with what other groups around the country are doing and around the world, because a lot of progress is being made elsewhere around the world, which is very helpful to inform our process as well. So it's an ongoing project and process, and I'm here to stand up for the community that we deserve better than to be treated like second-class citizens with having getting wakened up and being polluted like we are. Okay, uh, we have a reader. Sorry, they don't have a response. I apologize. As nervous as we are. <laughs> I, I think that the airport, it's our neighbor. Um, it's not being a very good neighbor, but this is one issue that ties us all together, irrespective of where, where you land on the aisle. The reality is that there are very few studies, national studies, and they all prove that jet fuel has a higher content of lead that disproportionately affects developing children. This is a reality. And so there's got to be something that's done around that expansion. It's not going away, um, while at the same time, um, as a teamster, right, we are advocating more accountability from the port. So irrespective of the outcome of this election, the reality is that we're going to continue to fight to have that, that port accountable. One of the ways that we can do that is by districting, making sure that we have one person at least from Burien that's on that, uh, on that board to make sure that our voices are being heard. And yes, I also agree with Jimmy that we do need a community benefits agreement to do two things, right? Provide uh, a labor management agreement uh, to ensure that the jobs are being done with good paying jobs that are taking care of families, while at the same time providing opportunities to people that live in and around the airport. So while it's there, let's try to make it as accountable as we can to all of us. And I think this is one issue that should unite us all together, uh, irrespective of where we're at. Uh, we have a reader asking about parking. The reader's comment and question is, parking is a problem in the downtown of Burien. The city will need a new parking structure in the downtown very soon. How would you plan to finance this structure? Yes, uh, we do have a parking problem downtown for our small businesses. Right now, to be able to get a parking space, if your restaurant needs seven parking spaces, you need to come up with $10,000 per parking space, meaning that you need $70,000 to open up a restaurant in Burien. How, how, how does this benefit Burien? It's very difficult. You know, we have some of these restaurants. I was talking to uh, one of the ice cream shops down on 153rd Street. Says, you know, Jimmy, I have to sell 150 ice cream cones to stay open per day. Um, you know, we, we do have, we're strapped for money. We have some challenges for money. But we also have other partners. We have the county. We have the state. 
you know, we are, when it comes to poverty, 3% uh, higher than the national average. Uh, Highline High School, you know, we over almost half of the population is on free and reduced lunch. So we really need to bring in partners uh, to come and help us with some of the situations that we have going on in Burien. I can tell you that uh, there's been B and O tax, but we can't continue to tax our small businesses, our citizens, to be able to uh, fulfill some of this stuff, right? So I think that we need to really uh, work with uh, partners when it comes to the county and the state. Thank you. I totally agree with Jimmy on this one, that we can't continue to tax our businesses or our residents. Um, we need to find a way to fund parking. We are really in need of additional parking, especially in our downtown. We have a study that was recently done that says we're only half full. That doesn't seem to be correct in my mind. Um, I think we need to be careful with what we're doing with the parking, with the budget, with a lot of these things. So um, I, my goal is to really encourage economic development by loosening some of the restrictions on small business, making it easier for business to start, and making it easier for them to be successful. That is, I think, our best option for revenue stream for Beery and for the future for parking. There are other things that we can do. We do have available parking on 153rd and in our municipal lot and in our parking garage. If we had a community shuttle that could shuttle people around, it would help relieve some of the parking stress that we have. But I do agree with Jimmy that the, the financing cost of the parking stall is really way too expensive for a small business that's just opening, even though that's change of use, but still it makes it impossible for somebody to come in and do something different with the building without incurring a huge amount of cost. So, um, Council Member Tost and I have agreed to suspend some of those rules temporarily, and hopefully we can come up with a plan on how to uh, derive revenue for uh, new innovative parking solutions. Thank you. Revenue to provide for development is something that's always going to be an issue with a cash-strapped city. Uh, we know that. That's the reality. All small businesses that look to expand here in Burien, it's difficult for them. We've got these national uh, formulas that are being applied to the small business on how many uh, parking lots they're going to be required to have if they're going to open up. And that, that doesn't work out. Let's eliminate, I, I agree with, with the other folks here, let's eliminate some of that red tape. Let's go ahead and make it easier. Let's sit down and figure out what we're able to do. Let's enter in some of these public-private par uh, partnerships to develop some of these parking lots uh, to get us there, right? We don't have to go at it alone. So that's, that's where I'm at with this. I would have to agree with everything everyone said. And one thing I would <laughs> add to that is, you know, when we ask the question, where are we going to get the money for parking? Where are we going to get the money for anything? Okay, so we've let economic development as a goal kind of just die on the vine. Um, we have no projects, no major development projects in the pipeline. Uh, so it isn't just a matter of where we're going to find money to pay for parking. We're going to find money to pay for all of the things we want to do. We have a major issue. All right. Uh, another interesting question from a reader. The reader wants to know, what have you already done in your own neighborhood to make this a better community? Well, we have a really um, very strong blog watch group, and we are participating together in the National Night Out each year. Um, we all get to know our neighbors a little better. We all share our email address, and if we see something unusual going on in the neighborhood, we let everybody know. Um, I know that uh, in the past, Council Member Edgar has gone out and worked with the group to mark all the drains so that people are aware of the fact that the area that we live in drains into very critical areas and estuaries that are delicate and have problems at times, including drinking water supply and wetlands. So um, I haven't been a direct part of marking those drains with Council Member Edgar. But I have been somebody who has stopped using any kind of, um, you know, environmental um, pesticides or herbicides or um, fertilizer or anything like that on my yard so that 
these, the drainage that goes into these estuaries is not contaminated and causing an environmental impact. So we're careful about even washing our cars or doing any kind of, you know, anything that might have an impact outdoors, being careful with that. So block watch, uh, environmental stewardship, and right directly in my neighborhood, besides letting my yard go natural, which I don't know if the neighbors appreciate or not, <laughs> is, is about it. Thank you. So I've been involved in the community on two different levels. One is in terms of work. Um, we represent hundreds of members here in Burien that we've been active, uh, both through work and um, other means to ensure that folks can stay within the middle class. And I, thought, I, I know that's a little bit more abstract than the nitty gritty of have you changed the sign, have you uh, gone to the park to do a cleanup, uh, but that's more of the work that we, that we do on a daily basis. Um, and it's, it's really difficult work in terms of uh, holding the port accountable. Uh, how do we raise the standards for workers to ensure that they're able to stay uh, within the middle class here in Burien? Many of those workers, airport workers, live in, live in and around our communities. Um, so in terms of the economic fight with employers, uh, that's something that I've been dedicated for the last eight years uh, that I've been here in, in Washington, and I'm really proud of the track record that we've had to be able to maintain. Um, we've had many of our folks that have retired um, and live here in Burien, and so that's something that we're also proud of, to make sure that they've got dignity and respect uh, when they reach the, the age of being able to retire. Um, so those are things that we actually, I'm really proud to talk about, uh, beyond just the abstract or, or more of the nitty gritty of the community stuff. Uh, that does take place. I admire that. It's been really unfortunate that we haven't been able to do more of that. Um, but that's pretty much the work that we've been involved with. So I'll go with most recent. Something really easy to do in your own neighborhood uh, that I did this year. I put up crosswalk flags at the local community pool. Uh, always a very fast uh, driving street. Uh, I put these things out with my own money, my own time. Uh, immediately changed the dynamic on the street. Just seeing the flags hanging off the side of, side of the posts, uh, everyone slowed down, everyone used them, and to my surprise, not one flag was stolen the entire summer. Um, so this is a real easy thing to do. It was like 45 bucks worth of materials in about two hours of time, um, and I just did it. Someone asked, uh, did you ask for permission? I said, no, it cost 45 bucks. If they take the pole down, uh, because I did put it on a city pole, uh, but if I save some kid's life, you know, I think it was worth the cost of the pole and the 45 bucks I spent. Uh, and again, you can do this in your own neighborhood. Well, <clears throat> some of the things that I am already doing in our community to make it better, first of all, is making sure that the state agencies are not targeting our minority businesses in Berea, like the nail salons, like the restaurants, so I was able to set up a meeting with the governor with seven businesses from Burien, La Estacion, to say, hey, we've had about enough of this. Uh, the regulatory agencies are targeting minority businesses and we're not going to put up with that in Burien. On top of that, uh, providing jobs. Uh, I was a labor for 20 years, a labor leader, and I decided to become a business owner. So I own a business. Uh, we provide apprenticeship opportunities uh, that the state has outlined what the requirements would be, would be, so we're a state training agent, providing health care for the individuals that work for me so they don't go on state assistance, and on top of that also a pension, so when they retire, they retire with dignity. Uh, the other thing is I'm also the vice chair of Latino Civic Alliance, and so I'm the chair of the Small Business Committee. Uh, what we advocate is civic, uh, civic engagement, education, public safety, and the most important thing that uh, we're working on is de-escalation and training of our police officers. Now an animal question. A couple of readers asked about CARES, Burien's nonprofit animal shelter facility, and whether you support continuing that versus being part of King County's animal control. Yes. <laughs> I wholeheartedly support um, CARES, and I'm gonna, this is my reason. You know, our, our animals are like our families, and I remember when I left the door open in my home, and we had Oakley get lost. My daughter was crying all night, 
I was very distraught uh, because of my daughter, and because of the dog, but more because of my daughter, seeing her crying. And uh, so somebody posted our little dog on Facebook. Next thing I know, somebody says, hey, your dog's at period care. And I, I went over there, and I gotta tell you, it was the happiest day of my life to see the little dog there. Back to the <laughs> On top of that, my friend said, hey, you know, she's a woman in the construction industry. Very hard for women to find jobs in the construction industry and, and to be respected. So uh, she said, hey, can I leave my dogs with you? I'm going, oh my, okay, you know. Gonna take it for the team, and so then the dogs get out, and guess what? You're in care, safe. <laughs> so when I lived over in front of Hazel Valley, our dog uh, ended up uh, getting out of the house, and I ended up going to the King County facility. It's nothing like having your own taking care of your own. So CARES has improved their service quite a bit over time. They are now, um, according to, I talked to Deborah George recently, and she did get the cat shelters from the Humane Society um, that are not the press with, they're the metal cages, which are much better for cleaning and upkeep for the animals. So I was excited to hear about that. And um, as CARES continues to improve, I support their contract. I'm thankful that we have this service local in Burien and that people really appreciate it. Uh, the community is very engaged with CARES. They're, they have a lot of volunteers, so a lot of people really enjoy helping there. Um, as, and children too, so, and it's very um, good for the community. It's good for pets. It's cost less than King County, and uh, I think it's a great thing to have. I support homegrown uh, local nonprofit, so that's great. I do support them. Um, I could say I might lose some votes, though. I'm not a pet owner, um, <laughs> but I do support them wholeheartedly. All right. Uh, we have a reader asking about the minimum wage. With other communities raising the minimum wage, do you support Burien raising its minimum wage, and if so, to what? <laughs> um, my local and personally I was very involved with the $15 an hour minimum wage fight in, in SeaTac and in Seattle uh, also with the paid family leave in, C, uh, in Seattle and in Tacoma and recently at the state level um, with the paid family leave. So I'm very proud of the accomplishments that we have done. Uh, there's many studies and many debates about how the minimum wage was gonna close down so many businesses. And the reality is that businesses have nothing but thrive in that environment. And so that's great. There are caveats, there are exemptions, and I hope that we look closely. Let's figure out a policy. If people wanna talk about raising the minimum wage, let's go ahead and do that. But let's do that at a, at a pace and a rate that makes sense for Burien. We don't need to adopt other, other communities' uh, um, responses to minimum wage. Let's figure out how that uh, can impact local businesses and make the appropriate exemptions for small businesses where we need to. So that's my position on it. Am I next? Uh, no, I'm not for it. Um, I believe it uh, alienates those and disenfranchises those that are at the most risk. Uh, people with low skill or uh, young people entering the workforce. Uh, if you can't bring your skill up to the pay level, you're cut out. And that's also what we've seen in Seattle where they've gone to 15 now. And they haven't even hit 15 yet. Well, I support the $15 an hour as long as our businesses are going to be being able to thrive our small businesses. Here's the reason why I support them. Very easy. My mother's here today supporting me. Worked very hard to make sure that there was food on the table that you eat here today fruits and vegetables. I'm a farm worker, and that's how I grew up. My uh, sister and my brother-in-law, they're caregivers. You know how much rent is in Burien? You know how much are bills that went up? Um, the other thing is, you know, it's like a business owner put it, put it just right. Jimmy, now come on. If Seattle's going to pay $15 an hour, Tukwila's going to pay $15 an hour, the airport's going to pay $15 an hour, what are we going to end up getting as far as workers? Because this is what I'd like to see. I'd like to see youth be able to work and have some kind of training. And I said, well, that's great. You know why? Because we have the best kept secret out here called the Puget Sound Skill Center, who has a program. 
so they can put youth to work. Very important. We do have to have that conversation with our small businesses and making sure that language to protect them not going out of business is in place. So I have a slightly different story. I've been a union member with UFCW 21 for 20 years. And when they started talking about the $15 an hour, I was asking them, what about the journeyman wages? They were silent on it. So while I was with a union that was advocating for people who didn't work at my workplace yet, I was expecting less than a 1% increase, if at all. So there would have been very little difference, if, almost unremarkable at all, between someone at an entry-level job and my six-step journeyman spot that I t it took me six years to climb to where I was at. So what it does is it cuts all the rungs off of coming up into the business to gain the skills, to learn the company, to understand what you're doing. And it gives that person that has just started almost equal footing with me who's been there 15, 20 years. So I didn't feel it was fair and I didn't feel it was right. I would have liked to have seen the union put more effort into working hard for the people that are already there on the floor. So I had this discussion with my union and we didn't see eye to eye on the 15 now. They still endorsed me, that was last campaign. They won't endorse me anymore, but they did endorse me then. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of problems with $15 an hour for Beery, and I think we have a lot of struggling small businesses, and I think it would overburden many of our business, um, our small businesses. So I would tread very cautiously with mandating something like that. We did pass a resolution in our, our um, comprehensive plan to uh, allow this to be addressed at the state level so that it's uniform. As long as it's uniform, it won't disparage one group over another. Okay, this is an interesting question. You might want to take a little time to think. One person wants to know, what is your favorite book, apart from a religious text? So you cannot say Bible, Torah, Quran. So if you want to take 20 seconds to think about it, they would like to know your favorite book. I can start off with that one. Uh, yeah. To be fair, who, whose turn was it to go first? Joel. Do you mind if he goes to the wiki? I thought he was well, I, 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 still, uh, I have a lot of favorite books, but I'll geek out a bit here. I'm going to go with Lord of the Rings. There's a book that uh, opened my perspective and my eyes. It's called Why You Like Me. If you haven't read it, read it. Why You Like Me, Chris Wise. Tim Wise. My mother's favorite book was Alice in Wonderland. Um, I'd have to say my favorite book is, I'm, a, I'm kind of a romantic and I sort of like the Jane Eyre and the Wuthering Heights books that I read when I was young. Finding literature that reflects your experiences and gives you validity to who you are is really hard, especially when you're coming of age. And I think, to me, the book that opened up my eyes to that was Labyrinth of Solitude. I really enjoy that book, so I do recommend it. Okay, now a toughie. We have a candidate, or I mean a reader, who is very concerned about the number of 4-3 votes uh, on Berrien City Council. Uh, the comment is, uh, we, cannot for we cannot forever have a divided Burien. If you're elected, what will you do to break the current 4-3 voting status so we get more majority votes and not divided votes? Uh, I believe, yeah. Well, really it falls down on your beliefs, right? And, uh, you know, I'm part of the compassion of sleep. I'm part of the slate that believes of inclusion, um, and you know, and what we have going on right now is that we have a slate uh, that's already on the council right now that has conservative views and perspectives, which is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Listen, at the end of this election, it's going to be very clear and cut. We're either going to be a very conservative town where we want to have law and order, or we're going to be uh, we're going to have the other candidates that are going to be talking about how do we include people. Are rules that are put in place and laws fair? Because there was a lot of ways in this country that were never fair. 
women weren't able to vote. We had slavery in this country. So the question is, what is rules and order? The question is, the candidates that are going to be representing Virian, what's your perspective? Is it inclusion or is it exclusion? So our council votes is very reflective, actually, of our election race because we will have a majority that votes in whoever wins this election, and it won't be an overwhelming majority. It will be 52% to 48% or whatever that uh, number will be. So we have different views in the, in the community. What I really think people should understand is that we're policy makers. We react to the things that are brought to us by staff in um, regulating what goes on in the city. We're not creative masters where we're bringing issues in. We're not issue driven. We are uh, have a budget that's allotted for a two year cycle that pays for roads, which don't discriminate, they're in inclusive, this is an inclusive community. We don't pay some places and not others based on anybody's color or anybody's background. Um, we include everybody when we put the budget the money for the parks and rec so they can put their toilet paper into the facilities at the park. Uh, none of that discriminates against anybody. It's when we bring issues into the council that we create divisiveness. It's when these come from outside forces like the 15 now and sanctuary city, those kind of things create controversy and they cause division. We shouldn't let those kind of things be deciding how we govern or who we are as a city because our primary function as a council is to develop policy and make everything fair and make everything as good as we possibly can with the very scant budget that we have. I'm gonna call file on that one. Uh, the reality is that we have a council that's I ideological, uh, ideologically based. Uh, they signed the Initiative 1 petition that was supported by USA Inc., who is a, uh, on the watch list of the Law and Poverty Center as, as a racist group. I mean, let's call it how it is. Let's not hide behind this policy and pretend it's not real. When people that are debating up here actually signed on to that petition, all right, so let, let's be real about that. It's not outside forces that are being brought in. Well, you sign on to that, right? The reality is that, like Jimmy said, there's two slates and there's two ways that we're gonna pivot. We either have a compassionate and inclusive slate of people that believe in each other and believe in a future that believes in all of our children, irrespective of the color of their skin, or we're gonna turn around and have a, a community that wants to pretend that the world hasn't changed since 1950 or 1963. We wanna be more exact, right? That's what we have in front of us. and. The voters are going to have the opportunity to make that choice. So what we do have to do, whether you're on one side of the aisle or you're on the other side of the aisle, go out and vote because it's horrendous that we've got less than 50% of registered voters actually turning out to vote. So what I say to Joe, what I say to Debbie, and what I say to everyone on the opposition slate is mobilize your voters because we're out there and we're going to mobilize our voters based on our values. And that's what we want to see done. And we want to make sure that this election is the most uh, highest turned out election that we can have. That's what's going to make me proud. Uh, irrespective of whether we win or lose, it's about listening to each other. And at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we can listen to each other. That you all walk away from this election knowing that you're not 100% correct. That there is a need to listen to each other and to continue to build community. We don't have to agree, but we do have to build community and common ground. Thank you. So first, I'd like to say I was born in 1969. I don't remember the 50s because I wasn't there. I don't remember 63 either because I wasn't there. Uh, how do we stop the 4-3 vote split? Um, I can recommend four candidates uh, that I think could easily stop that. Uh, and the other thing, I have to say, I resent this idea that only your slate owns compassion. That's you know, simply not true. Uh, you can keep saying that if you want. And you can you can try and own compassion like we're somehow these evil people that have no compassion in our heart, but that's a line of bull. Yeah. 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 Alright, our next question is about homelessness. And the reader wants to know um, what you think of the problem and how to fix it. 
So uh, we have a collaborative effort going on with a number of other agencies in the region that are partnering, partnering on All Home to try to address this issue with a lot better funding resources than what Burien has. Um, Burien has relied on uh, human services funding for a number of different organizations in our community that we directly fund from our budget to help with the issue. So we're helping. We can't solve the problem completely, but we're partnering with other organizations in the region, like I said, to help understand better what the different categories of homeless are, where we can best be effective in helping people, and what that costs and how that works. So um, we have organizations in Burien, a faith-based community, a lot of them, who are doing quite a lot to help the homeless. They are providing services for people to go get into rehabilitation programs or mental health counseling, temporary shelter, job skills. Um, I volunteer with Transform Burien and they're doing a lot of great work on helping people transition out of homelessness. But there is one big criteria for that to work. The person has to want to transition out of homelessness and that is the greatest hurdle because people that are in the homeless community a lot of times feel safe and secure in that environment that they're in. They know the people there, they get what they need there, and it's difficult for them to transition out. Once they do decide to do that, there are a lot of programs that we have in place in Burien that will help and provide them their needs. Well, this is where compassion gets tested a little bit. Uh, the reality is that we've seen policies and people espousing such things as giving $25 Safeway card and a ticket out of those city. That's where I see some of that. Or they go with a law and order type of approach that if they're sleeping or camping or panhandling, that's going to be a no-no and we're going to kick them out of the city. Where are they going to go to? As a person that represents uh, people that work at the Department of Corrections, COs and law enforcement uh, officers in the city, uh, in, in SeaTac, and at UW, and the city of Pacific, and has advocated for the last 12 years of my career for public safety, um, because those are the folks that I've worked with. Uh, I can tell you the last thing that an officer wants to do is arrest someone because they're poor. I think that homelessness cannot be a one type of approach only, and that's where we've had it wrong. It's great that the council took a step to hiring someone to help coordinate the health and human services, but the reality have $330,000 per year of our budget being divvied up in like 30 different organizations, you tell me how much $10,000 is gonna make a difference in somebody's life to transition that person from homelessness into some type of job. It doesn't work. And so the reality is that we need to do more. We can't do it alone. Burien needs the collaboration of nonprofits, of the county, and it needs the collaboration of, uh, of other uh, municipalities. Just like we collaborate on the score jail, I think that's something that we also have to do and we haven't done because we. We talk past each other. And what we want to be is we want to be right and not actually collaborate to find common ground to find a solution that makes sense for Burien. And so homelessness is a real issue that we need to fix. And it's a, 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 a more of a health and human service issue than it is a public uh, uh, arresting someone. Right? So thank you. Is it my turn? Um, I think to solve a problem, you really have to know what the cause of the problem is. And the biggest problem we have now that we call homelessness is addiction. Uh, and so you have to solve addiction with treatment. If you continue to enable an addict to live the life of an addict, they will continue to be an addict. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever lost anyone to addiction, but I have. Uh, we enabled, out of compassion, we felt sorry for this individual. They had lost their military career. This is how their addiction started. Uh, they're dead, okay? The road goes one way. Either you seek recovery or you eventually die. There's only two choices. You can tell yourself you're being compassionate, giving them some money, helping them out, letting them crash at your place. Uh, my friend's dead. I don't think that's the way we want to treat everyone else. Well, mine's more intimate because I lost my father uh, to a drug overdose. And he wasn't being enabled. You know, I'm a, I was 
victimized by the conditions of what he had to go through as a young man. Um, you know, I think that the city's made some good, some good steps forward, at least one step, which is hiring a human uh, service manager. That's the first step. I'd like to hear his report. Are these uh, uh, homeless people from our community? Are they transient? Is it because of the emergency room? Is it because we have uh, mental facilities here where we help youth with mental illness? Uh, let's look at why, right? We've been in a war for a long time in this country. A lot of soldiers that are wounded, a lot of soldiers that ended up getting on prescription drugs, mm -hmm. suffering, you know, post-traumatic stress, uh, which has led into drug addiction. Uh, young men, young men and women who have been victimized in any way, abusive parents. Uh, just the other day, I heard a parent say, "You're 18, you're moving out of the house." No exceptions. Uh, the other thing is uh, mental health. Uh, so the question is, you know, what what are the issues that we need to address? I just don't buy that you enable people. I don't think people want to be a drug addict or a drunk. I mean, it just, it just doesn't connect in my mind. Uh, we have 15 minutes left, and uh, then I think at 8.15, we're supposed to start your closing statements. But if you guys want to go beyond that, we can maybe go to 8.20. So more questions. We have one that was on addiction, since it kind of came up. And the question was, what programs exist in other cities or states that you believe could be implemented in Burien to leave our drug addiction problem? So, I grew up uh, in the city of Compton, and I grew up at a time when uh, the epidemic of drug addiction, of seeing people dying in the streets, uh, was really, uh, real and formative to my life. Um, we partnered in the city of Compton, I was part of a, a youth program that we partnered with churches, we partnered with the city, we partnered with the school district. And what we were able to do is we went and we identified as at-risk youth. And it was a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring program that we were engaging to figure out what people are going through. And there's underlying issues that are happening that lead people on a pathway, and unfortunately, instead of being tracked in a positive way, they're being tracked to, to go to jail, really. Um, and so those are some of the things that I grew up with, and I hope that we're able to implement something similar here so that we can avoid um, going down that road. Another thing that helps and that gives people hope for a better tomorrow is having good paying jobs. There is no better indicator of saving someone from either gangs or drug addiction or just being down and out, then providing a good paying job that provides wages, that provides a future. And I hope that we can all collaborate on that one because I think this is where we, it does require a complex issue um, and we need to hold each other accountable to this and we need to hold accountable uh, maybe some of the pharmaceuticals that are pushing um, our doctors to over prescribe some of these opiates that are going on in our community. So it's happening across the country, it's something beyond Bure, and I hope that, that maybe as a small community, we can all come together and figure something out so that, you know, things that happen in, in the experience that Joe went through also, and myself and Jimmy, don't get our stories that are repeated up here. Uh, Long-term treatment away from the environment of your addiction is probably the most successful way to treat. Uh, I think Everett has a great program. They're giving scholarships, basically treatment scholarships. So they get you out of the environment. A lot of these places are out of state. Uh, and that's a good thing because you can't be in the environment where you're an addict. You have to be away from it. You have to be away from it for, statistically, they say at least six months. And then when you're done, you need to stay away from that environment. You need to go into, uh, you know, uh, halfway homes, like uh, Second Chance, uh, sober living here, where you can be in a tight-knit group of people that can support you. Uh, recovery, especially from opioid addiction, is not a three-week project. This is a long-term thing. If you have spent five years as an addict, you are not solving this in, in two months. This is a year, two-year, five-year project of recovery and getting your life back on track. And, and I understand Jimmy's story, but I think one thing I took away from what he said was he said he couldn't understand how somebody would want to live that way. They don't want to live that way. That is the point. This is addiction. None of these people want to be this way. They are driven and compelled by addiction. They cannot control it. It has 
complete hold of their life. Uh, you can't continue to enable that. You've got to get them out of the environment and get them into treatment. Well, <clears throat> a couple of things that I think that, you know, don't uh, mistake in compassion with weakness. Um, you know, drug dealers, you're going to jail. Game, game member recruiters, you're going to jail. Personal, prop, uh, personal property thieves, you're going to jail. That's the number one thing is getting the drugs off the streets. The other thing is counselors, right? We need counselors. We need people to be able to talk to someone. Um, and hey, you can counsel. We need more engagement from the community to sympathize with some of the individuals that are going through hard times. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, what somebody just needs is that one conversation, that one, that one reminder that we all have a mother, a father, an aunt, a grandmother that loves you. Um, the other one is peer to peer, right? Um, I just think that when we isolate people, you know, people just continue to gravitate towards drugs. You know, I don't know if it's happening to you, but it's happening to me. There's a, there's a national threat of war. There's national disasters going on across the country. Youth doesn't even know if they're gonna have a job or if they're gonna be able to buy a home. These are real issues that, if they don't depress you, they sometimes depress me. So I, um, I had a family member who was addicted for a long period of time, and the only thing that saved that person was their decision to stop. And once that person made that choice and went into treatment, they were able to get over it. But enabling and you know making it easy for someone to remain as an addict, I think, is is creates a burden for that person. I I I don't know how being a parent and having children, it seems like you you have to say what's right and what's wrong. And you have to draw the line, and you have to make them understand why it's bad. If they cross that line and you give them tough love, it, it will drive them to the point, to the bottom, where they will really want to get the kind of help that they need. Um, it's a hard thing to do as a parent. And I wouldn't say that that person doesn't have compassion because it breaks a parent heart, a parent's heart to you know, force their child to have to come to grips with what they're doing that's bad for them, that they need to stop. But I think that that's the best way to end addiction. It's with tough love. So we have a question about the city's recreational needs. Uh, the reader says there will be 400 new residents in the city when the town square buildings are built. Youth, families, elderly, and students already living in the city complain about the lack of recreational facilities, and over 80% of the residents in our city can't swim. How would you fund and deal with the city's recreational needs? I think this goes back to the economic development. I mean, I would love to have a recreational center. I would love to have a pool. I would love to have a place for our youth to go. Uh, and learn to swim. Uh, I think everyone should know how to swim. I, I, that rate is high. Um, but it comes back to where is the money? Uh, we have, again, let economic development as a goal languish. Um, so back to parking, back to recreational centers. Where's the money? Um, we have to target that as the main goal. It is the thing that creates all the money that we can get to do all these things that we want to do. But yes, I would love that in this city. When I first moved to Peoria, my son was going to a school that was unacceptable. As a taxpayer, I said, you know, I'm willing to pay to have my son go to a good school. Um, you know, look, if we're, gonna, if we're gonna talk about crime in our community, you know how much crime is costing our community? You know how much is costing us the police? Question is, are we gonna have that tough conversation and quit making up excuses that we don't have money in the budget? We all know that. Right? Or are we going to have those conversations with citizens of Burien and say, is this something you, we, that we really need? Can we bring in the Bill Gates Foundation? Can we bring in some of these foundations? Because we definitely have a great problem. I mean, I've heard, I've heard it loud and clear. We have crime. We're, we're one of the uh, cities that's, you know, that's one of the worst in the country when it comes to poverty. I mean, if we're not advocating for ourselves as community members, we can't expect anybody to come save us. It's just not going to happen. So 
one of the things that I really advocated for to put on our economic development priorities list was to work toward getting a, a recreation center for all ages, not just youth, but for our seniors as well. Our community center that's at the skateboard is deteriorating, and we have to do something with this. It's costing us money just to maintain it, and it adds up each year because it becomes more and more of a, of a problem. So we did have a study that looked at um, what our options were for funding a community recreation center, and it was very expensive, and it was going to be very aspirational because it was way beyond what we could budget or, or um, do at that time. So the one thing that um, Council Member Edgar and I went and looked at other recreational centers, found that cities had partnered with like the Boys and Girls Club and other agencies, and had built their centers with these grants and partnerships with other groups. And we have not done anything to work toward that. Even though it's been on our list, we are not putting our, our economic development department's feet to the fire about moving forward with looking for partners, like, like I said, like the Boys and Girls Club, and getting our, our um, project specs redone because it was, it was really way overblown. So that's something that I have on my list of things that I would have liked to have accomplished in the last four years. I would still like to push forward with that because that's something our community needs and something the community was actually promised a number of years ago and not delivered on. So we owe it to the community. We need to get the ball rolling. Well, I think we need a plan for the next 20 years. We, don't, we, we lack a plan. That's what it comes down to. Uh, we don't have a vision of where we want to go to as a community, and so because of that, we're a little bit rudderless of what's going on. And I think one of the things that I do want to attach myself to is that we can't speak as, I'm going to deliver this, or I'm going to do this. I think for far too long, politicians want to run, and they pander to get votes. Um, I think what we need to do today is, is change our verbiage and make sure that we're talking about we as a community moving forward, where we're talking about what can we do to sit out and look at what our needs are and where are we going to be headed for the next uh, 4, 8, 10, 20, 50 years, right? I think that's the kind of vision that we need and I hope that moving forward we can all start looking at that vision of, of what Buren should be in the next, you know, millennia. All right, a reader wants to know, what is your plan for outreach and engagement of our growing immigrant communities to bring them into the conversation about Burien's future? Yeah. Well, you can start with me. Raul Español, buenas tardes. So, you know, uh, I gotta tell you, this campaign I will never forget these words that were inspirational but were haunting. I went out to the Alto Altura apartments and I was I seen these kids play. I said, hey, so what do you do after school? She goes, well, we run around. And she comes up and she goes, you know, things ain't the way they used to be anymore. I said, well, why not? She goes, well, we don't have a place to do homework anymore. I said, so what do you do? We run around. See, if we're really gonna if we're really gonna get to the immigrant, immigrant communities, we gotta go find the leaders. You know, there's leaders in the Spanish community. Spanish-speaking communities, in the African communities, in the Somali communities. You know, I uh, broke my heart to hear a teacher come and cry her heart out and say, I need help. I don't know what to do. The gang members are recruiting gang uh, students at the school. What do I do? How do I handle that? I said, ma'am, I said, I'm here. I'll go out there and help you talk about what the positive outcome is with education. I said, my son who just graduated college and who's a union apprentice, the carpenters talk about that life is not dim, that there's a future. So we really got to go out and we got to make the effort. You know, in this campaign, I got to tell you, my message is going to be in more than one language. So just to put a pin in that map there, uh, one of our census tracts in Burien has 26 languages spoken. So if we're going to put all those languages on one sign or in one magazine or in one format that we communicate with, that's very complex. So I do know that the Highland School District had a challenge of trying to engage with families um, that 
were not English language, they were English language learners, but not able to be easily engaged. They hired a consultant and did a big project on it because they were having so much trouble engaging many of these community members. So this is a complex issue. I don't have easy answers for it. Like I said, it's very expensive to put all of our literature into multiple languages. Um, uh, it would be good if maybe we had, we did include it in our Burien Magazine also, uh, alternate language pages for people that, and one of them is Spanish and another one is an Asian language. So, and it varies and alternates back and forth between those. But um, other than having an online format that's translated for people, it's pretty difficult to do on paper. So I'm just saying there's big challenges there. I don't have all the answers, but I would be very happy and willing to listen to ideas that other people have for accomplishing engagement with some of these hard to reach areas of our city. I believe in a world where many worlds are possible. So based on that, Let's go out there, let's feel a little bit vulnerable. I think going out uh, to meet communities that we traditionally don't connect with for one reason or another, it's very difficult. Um, but we have to do it. They're part of the community, we need to be inclusive, we need to bring them in. So why not create a commission on immigrant affairs? We've got a commission for everything else. Let's create a commission at the city and figure out what some of these community leaders want to uh, see change and improve in our city. Um, we may be surprised. Um, so that's my suggestion. I think the most important thing uh, is uh, to teach English. Uh, you need to be able to assimilate oh, into oh, Please, please let all yeah, the no, I'm going to continue. Thanks. Uh, you can have all the forms printed in all the languages you want, but once they leave that office, they still don't speak English. They cannot be fully enfranchised into everything this country has if they don't speak the language. They don't have to lose their original language. I'm sorry, are you, are you running for office? No, I'm not. Okay, please be quiet. Well, you can next time, thanks. Okay, okay, okay. All right, uh, please let the candidate finish and then uh, this candidate has, wants to use his pink card for one minute. Oh, no, I think I'm finished, thanks. Hey, I can understand the fear in our community of different languages. You know, I was raised in Efreda. I was the first immigrant family to be in Efreda that spoke Spanish. It was fearful. Fearful for me and fearful for them. But I also know this. Let's look at where we come from. Where was this nation born from? Italians. Irish. We still have places in New York that the, the people from the land still, still speak those languages. Is it important to speak English? Yes, it is important. Will it help you be, get a better job? Yes. Can you force your policies and procedures on people? No. This is the land of the free. What happened to our Constitution? What happened to being able to have the right to choose? I mean, look, our community is very divided. Very divided. We need to bring it together. Number one, yes, America is beautiful because we have the right to exercise the freedom of speech, the freedom of press, and the freedom of assembly. Okay, um, I believe I think we have time for one more question and then uh, candidate closing statements so we can wrap by 8.30. So the last question is dreaming. Suppose $500,000 materialized in the Burien City budget. You do not need to build consensus with other members of the council. How would you spend the money? <laughs> Let's say 500,000 one year and 500,000 the next year. So you have a two year plan. Two year plan. So I can't hire a couple of police officers because those are, that's a 500,000 ongoing. And you can't hire them and then tell them their job is temporary. So you're making a big investment in that. Um, and so what we could do is maybe um, gift out swimming lessons at the Evergreen Pool to all of the non-swimmers in Burien for two years. 
Would that, would that be enough? <laughs> <laughs> because the, the pool needs repair, so that would cover repairs, and then people could have life-saving skills that they can use for the rest of their lives. Um, maybe pony rides, and a, and a unicorn bus. <laughs> It's my, it's my money, right? I can spend it any way I want. So this bus, what it would do is be a feeder that would drive around, and it would be something Discover Burian would offer. And it's actually a trolley, so it's all open, so you can hop on and hop off anywhere you want. And what it does is advertise what a great place this is. So it's like at the end of the rainbow, the pot of gold. We send it over to the airport. We pick up a group of people. We bring them back here to spend all their money here and then take them back when we're done with them. <laughs> Two or three ideas. Take wow. Well, how do you transition from one conversation to the other? Um, <laughs> Pony rates sound really cool. Um, why not expand one of our community centers? Let's invest a little bit in, in instruments. Let's invest in uh, bringing people together. Uh, over a million dollars, I know that it's a drop in the bucket really in terms of budgeting, uh, but there's something that maybe some community's uh, organization could put to use. Maybe uh, a nonprofit like Colectiva Legal can put it to work to help out people that are now being affected by DACA uh, that are gonna be excluded. And these are kids uh, that came here without any fault of their own um, and now are being threatened with almost deportation from the Trump administration. Why not help them out? I think I'm gonna pass on the unicorns. Um, but uh, <laughs> I think it definitely would, 500,000 is not a huge amount of money. I would put it towards a community center, um, probably a trade program uh, that could be offered through the uh, uh, trade skills program, could be offered through the community center. Well, I'd go out and figure out how we can get matching funds to, uh, to double that. Um, on top of that, I would uh, set up a program with other organizations. I know there's members of the Carpenters Union here today, and we build ramps for people with disabilities. Uh, grab bars uh, for our elderly. Uh, you know, look, our baby boomers are aging in rapid numbers, and some of them can't live alone anymore. They, they need the help, and so I would actually set a program, uh, either it's ramps, grab bars, or something for our seniors. Okay, I think it's time for closing statements. So they'll each have two minutes. Please hold your applause um, until after the speaker speaks. And if you'd like to applaud then, that's fine. We're going to go in reverse order from right to left this time. Okay. I'd like to thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, it's greatly appreciated. I know I'm probably speaking for everyone up here when I say uh, it's really been an honor to take part in this forum. Uh, and I'm sure it's been made clear tonight that Burian is pretty much at a fork in the road. Uh, we have two slates here. We have two distinct different visions of how to go forward. Uh, in my opinion, we've seen in the past four years what one divisive council member on the council can do. Uh, can totally stagnate and stop all forward motion. Uh, my opponent has already demonstrated a, a similar activist style. He's been to city council meetings. He's led protest chants. He's disrupted council meetings. Uh, and he's on the record leveling irresponsible, untrue, and insulting allegations at sitting council members. Same people he's going to be expected to work with if he was to be elected. I'd like to think that council member Wagner and I represent stability and rationality. We're going to provide city leadership guided by common sense and a healthy respect for the proper role of city government. Look, the wrong turn now leads to a predictable four more years of Nothing happening, no business development, and the same kind of activist and argument uh, that's gone on in council me uh, meeting after council meeting. Again, the choice in front of us is clear, the contrast is clear. We can move towards a healthy economy and a safe community 
with a focus on the city's obligations to its residents, or we can continue with partisan activism. We're at a fork in the road. Please, let's pick the right path. Thank you. We are very much at a crossroads of where do we want to move forward. And I think tonight was really clear indicative of what the future could be. Do we want a future that believes in exclusion, it's only us, English only, or do we want a future that believes in inclusiveness? And I think beyond the mudslinging, let's be real. What's, what's happening here is that we've got a community that needs a lot of services, needs a lot of community development, needs public safety, and let's focus on the nitty gritty of everyday life to improve Burien beyond the rhetoric that we have in front of us. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for all your time and patience and excitement about this race. I just want to thank everybody for being here and for the opportunity to tell you some of my ideas and my plans and goals and aspirations that I have for being on the council. If I'm reelected, I will stand against the encroachment of the airport into our quality of life. I will put a ban, do everything I can to put a ban on heroin injection sites in Burien, and it's coming. They're trying to push it on us. I will stand against uh, radical, um, I don't know, Seattle policies that are radical and bad for our community. I will stand against any additional tax increases. I have voted against all of them. I will not be for any further tax increases. Um, I will be for law and order, for beefing up our police and our public safety as much as is possible with the budget that we have. I do not believe police officers are required to be social workers. That's a different branch of the city. So I want our police officers to address crime and I want other people to address social issues. So that's what I stand for, and that's what I've worked for, and you can see my record that I've stood against these things that I believe are bad for Burien. First of all, I want to thank everybody for being here tonight. You know, it's been a, it's been a learning experience of running for office. Uh, but more than anything, I want to thank you know those individuals that have come out and helped me, and I felt so loved. Thank you. Um, as far as divisiveness, you know, how many workers have died building America and building wealth before we had OSHA? How many women have been beat for the right to vote or the right to make this equal amount of money as their counterpart in the man? How many soldiers have died? no matter what color or language they spoke for this country to have our rights. You know, how many civil disobedience walks, beatings that we have before we abolish slavery? You know, look, our country's changing. Our nation is changing. The world is changing. We're a world economy. We need to make sure that we foster uh, protection and for people that speak other languages and come from other places to come and be part of this nation, this country, and this city. And we need to make sure that we can negotiate the best deals for our city. And on top of that, you got my word. I have children, I have a mother, uh, uncle who suffers alcoholism. I will not do anything that's gonna hurt my family and you should feel, feel, uh, feel rest assured that I wouldn't do that for your family. Thank you. wants to say a few final words too. <laughs> I just want to say that it takes a lot of courage to run for office and I think every person up here is to be really just uh, thank you. Thank you to each of you. It takes a lot of courage. My name is Lori Crow and I am not a candidate. <laughs> 
Yeah, I did, and I approve this message. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for being here in El Dorado West. When Scott asked me if we would host this, I was honored because I'm a firm believer that age should never restrict civic involvement. Yes. And I think it's very important. As you are leaving, there are two elevators. There's an elevator down this way. There's also an elevator down this way, as well as a set of stairs. And I would remind you that we are in a residents home so if you could be as quiet as possible because some of them are already sleeping. Thank you so much. Thank you. And our next forum is a week from tonight. I'm supposed to plug October 3rd at Merrill Gardens for positions 5 and 7. Thank you everyone. Thank you.